All right. Hello and welcome. Uh, my name's Ben, and this is part eight in a series in which we implement a DSL for UI testing in Rust. Um, there's a lot to do still, um, and upcoming videos are going to include things like comparison to other tools because we are approaching a uh, language implementation that's sort of similar to some uh, to some paid tools out there. Um, and things like we're going to be adding, you know, um, we're going to be considering adding more complex programming concepts, things like procedures that you can extract, or you know, some notion of functions. Um, maybe have some page objects, something like that. Um, but right now, what we're going to do is probably the most important thing. Um, this video, I'm going to try to keep it short because I don't have a ton of time today. I'm going to try to keep it to an hour or an hour and a half. Um, but th in this video, we're going to grow up a little bit. Um, the way we've been building this so far has been very much the sort of haphazard exploratory programming you do in, you could say, the discovery phase. Um, what we need to do now is we need to go over how I fixed the bug I made when I was sleepy in the last video. Um, and then we need to do quite a bit of refactoring so that we have sort of professional, organized, readable code again. Um, and then most importantly, we need to implement a test framework. We need, we need to implement a testing suite. Um, so far, we've basically been flying blind. Um, we've been coding and we've been running, you know, running scripts every now and then to see if they're working. But it is officially time to start doing real, I don't want to say test-driven development, but at the very least, to start getting serious about uh, our test coverage. So let's do it. Um, let's start with what happened in the last video. So in the last video I was super sleepy um, and basically we were trying to we were trying to implement this functionality where when you run into a try again token the first time you run into it it will come back up to the last catch error statement um, and then it will re-execute the uh, re-execute the rest of the statements and then you know possibly run this again um, if it runs into an error again right meaning meaning this catch error executes and you decide to try again again um, this time it will simply exit the interpreting process so it will no longer run anything else in the, in the script the idea is that you don't want people getting caught in infinite loops, right? You don't you don't want people writing code that's just going to get stuck. Um, but you do want to have this notion of, hey, at least try try this again one more time, because sometimes it is just a slow request. Sometimes it is just a, you know uh, an issue with, oh, that element just happened to load really slowly this time. So. That's what that's what we were working on in the last video, um, and basically I had a whole mess with uh, with the self dot had error field um, where I was checking it in places it would never even execute, um, and I fixed that. So right now what we have, I'm going to host our test HTML again, and then I'm going to start running our Selenium standalone server again. Right, and the idea with building this on Selenium, by the way, um, is, be is the idea that for people who already have a um, Selenium-based test infrastructure in place, like if you're doing, if you're doing um, parallel testing with like Selenium node and hub and stuff, um, hopefully you should just be able we want to set it up where you can just sort of drop these scripts in place of a Selenium script test run, right? Um, so that you can sort of just set this on top of that existing Selenium test infrastructure. But anyway, um, and now let's run let's run this um, test one. 
So what it's going to do is it should go to this go to this um, test HTML. This step should pass. So this catch error step should not cause a screenshot. Then this step will fail. So we should skip the clicking of the submit button, right? Um, it won't click the submit button. It will instead jump down to the catch error and um, refresh the page and try again. And then actually I'll show you that. So you can see it's, it's waiting right now. Um, and then it will do it one more time and then it will exit the, the browser. So let's see what happens here. So that was the refresh, right? And you can notice the, the username field was typed in in the last, you know, before the last catch error step. So it's not doing that again. It's starting with trying to type in the password, but it's still, you know, we've got an incorrect locator, so that's still not working. And then the second time it tried to do it and it failed, this time it just quit. Um, that's the behavior we want. So try again is just a functionality where you can say, hey, try those last couple commands just one more time and then if, if they really are a failure, if it wasn't just a slow request, then we quit. Um, and then the idea is that if there's any sort of like reset um, commands you need to do, like maybe refresh the page, you can do that as part of your, your catch error handling statement. Okay, um, so that's working. I do wanna test one thing. So we know it's not going back and testing username so that's good. Yeah, um, I just I want to make sure it's still not executing this. So what I'm gonna do is, I mean, these screenshots don't execute, right? This this does isn't supposed to execute, so we won't even bother with that. Um, this isn't supposed to execute, so we won't bother with that. But what we'll say is, when we catch the error, we'll screenshot. And then we'll refresh and try again. So um, we'll look at we'll take a look at that screenshot. It should actually produce two screenshots because that catch error is going to execute twice. Um, but we want to do what we want to do is we want to make sure in the first one that the username has been typed in right because it's coming from that first run, um, and that the button is blue, meaning that this this command was skipped. We did go down to the catch error. Um, and then in the second screenshot, nothing should be typed into the fields because this is not supposed to re-execute. Um, and we also want to skip this click, so the button should still be blue. So let's do that. always forget that it pops up down here. Okay, so there we go. I think we're probably still in, yeah, we're in the we're in the first test run there. And it's going to time out trying to type into the password. And then it refreshed and now it's trying to type into the password again. And you can see the button the buttons appear to be blue both times. We just want to confirm. And there we go. So we have two screenshots. This is from the first test run when it failed. You can see we did not click the submit button. And this is from the second test run when it failed. And you can see we did not click the submit button. Great. OK. I was going to have us do like refactoring first. But I think actually let's get the, let's get the test set up going first and that way we can add tests as we're refactoring to like verify what it is we're doing. Um, now when I say testing, we we probably will do some unit testing, but what I'm talking about right now is basically in an integration test um, where we're going to as part of our like testing, we're gonna make sure that the um, we're gonna make sure that we have our test HTML available, and we're going to make sure that we have a Selenium um, grid available to register tests against, and then we're going to ru run, you know, provided scripts and get the output. 
So let's do that. Let's make a tests directory. That's the default for integration tests. Let's do a new file. And let's call this, um, we'll do this same script basically. Let's call this test catch error dot rs, right? And we'll say use schnauzer UI. We're going to use the run function, right? And the idea is that in the, in the in lib, we have this run function and we can give it some code. Um, and it will go through the whole process of scanning, parsing, and interpreting. Now, here's an interesting thing. How do we know if our test, um, how do we know if our test succeeded, right? This web driver result is only there because it's possible we weren't able to register um, a web driver. So what I think we want to do is propagate um, propagate um, information about whether the test passed or failed through the interpret function so that we can do some testing. So let's see how this works. If self.execute script, right, th execute statement, this returns a Boolean for whether it should quit, right? So here's what I'm thinking. And, um, by the way, it depends on who you ask, but I think generally returning a Boolean to as, as like um, information about whether or not uh, something succeeded or failed, that's probably a bad idea. You should probably use a result. Um, and we will probably address that as we refactor, but for now we just want to get something working. So I'm thinking, let's just propagate this Boolean, right? And then here, we return true, right? Meaning that the, um, right, this executes when execute statement returns that Boolean saying we should quit, right? This, this sort of propped up um, Boolean is saying, do we need to do an early return? Do we need, do we need to stop executing the script early? Um, and then we'll say, if we never hit that, we'll return false. Yeah, and so that will let us know um, whether or not our tests passed or failed. And then we also want to close the browser window. Then um, I added this um, just, uh, I, I can't remember if I added this on video or off video, but basically we just want to, when we're done, when we're done using the browser, we want to close it. Um, okay, so now Right, the interpret function should give us a boolean of whether or not our um, whether or not our script errored out. Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to propagate that boolean. Right, and again, we're going to probably refactor all of this and document what the you know what what these actual results mean in fact we'll probably build some sort of custom result type that ends up being like a result result and each level is like a, a severity of error and great um, we'll say let results equal interpreter dot interpret and then we'll say, okay, result. Great. So now the run function should return um, whether or not our script er errored early or not. So we're going to have basically two kinds of tests. We want tests that verify um, that a script succeeds and tests that verify that a test, that a script failed. Um, and then, you know, in the future we'll get more complex. Okay, cool. Let's try making a test. 
How do we set up integration tests in Rust? Rust integration tests. Yeah, so we have lib tests integration test rs. Great. You just annotate it with test. Cool. I'm good with that. Um, it's possible we'll need some special things to do async, um, but we might just do block on. So let's have a test that just asserts that 2 is the same as 2, and that way we can um, at least verify that we're running the tests. Let's run cargo T. Right, so you can see we have um, we have um, no unit tests, right? Um, and then we have this test add pass, right? And then we have our doc test um, in the scanner. Okay, cool. So we can run tests. Let's try and run a Schnauzer UI function as a test. So let's take this script. And let's basically say, let's rename test. Um, script exits on double try again All right and then let's say let script equal and then we're going to do like a block string here Right? That should do the trick. And then it's possible we should just read this in from a scripts folder because eventually um, we're going to end up um, adding sort of like syntax highlighting support um, for VS Code as well. So we'll go with this for now. Um, and then let's try to run it. So let's say let's result equal run and we'll give it the script dot await. And here we run into trouble, right? Um, you need to be a string And we run into trouble because we need to do an async test. So, async functions cannot be used for tests. Great. Do you have a recommended? Sometimes these errors will have like a recommended crate, like we had with the um, when we tried to do a recursive async function. Let's look up Rust async tests. Two easiest ways to test. It's 2020. We already used Tokyo, so let's look at this. I have an async function that I need to test. Blah, blah, blah. Just replace test with Tokyo test before any function. So I've used Tokyo test before. I just. Yeah. Let's do this. Hey, excellent. And then let's um, let's assert. Is there an assert false? Is that a macro? No. 
Let's just do a search equal results and false. Right, the idea being that um, because this caused an early return, um, we should get a, oh, and we need to, so we don't expect, so um, the return of the run function is a web driver result boolean, right? The web driver result is that it can return um, is exclusively because the constructor for the interpreter can fail, um, right? The constructor for the interpreter is in charge of instantiate, like building a web driver um, and registering it against Selenium for us. Um, but other than that, all the other all the other web driver related errors get sort of get handled and turned into our own errors. So we want to assert that this is okay false, meaning the constructor did not fail, um, but that the script um, cannot be returned applied to. Oh, so you can't. So result should return a web driver result boolean. You can't do web driver result boolean equals web driver result boolean. I wonder why. I wonder why you can't compare web driver errors. Obtain the success value. Well, let's do this. Let's assert that results dot is okay. And then let's assert that result dot unwrap is false. Great. Let's do it. So we're gonna run cargo test and we have our um, we have our you know test files running, uh, being served, and we have a Selenium uh, standalone grid running. So it's running that test. We may have to mess with um, timeouts. I think um, I think Rust te tests have a default like 60 second timeout. At the very least, it'll start printing out like warning this test has been running for more than 60 seconds. Okay. Great. Test failed. What's your problem? Exits on double try again. Panicked error closing driving driver window. Tried to run command without. So did you try to close the driver window twice? Right, you're saying it happened at interpreter 5242. Here we go. Oh, okay. Um, we tried to call when when we. Um, well, we never execute this. So, what's the deal? Right, so when we panicked, so when execute statement um, returned true, it should have called, you know what, we do a recursive call to interpreter. Um, so that must be it. So how do we want to do this? I 
mean, we can just do that. But then... If the test succeeds, presumably the window won't close, right? Let's look at that. Um, but I think that's what's going on. So uh, the uh, the try again command does a recursive call to the interpret function because it will it will simply call interpret on, on the list of previously executed statements, um, and then it will finish its interpret run. So what happened was um, the previously executed statements. Um, well, they errored. Well, no, it said it was the it said it was the one on line fifty six. So presumably they went off without a hitch. That's strange. I was thinking what happened was that. Um, yeah. Okay. So the test, the test passed and the driver closed, right? Because the test error. So if we look at references to interpret, uh, in the try again, right, we say if we, tr if we have already tried again, just go ahead and return OK true and that will sort of like bubble up the that we need to quit. Um, and then we call this interpret to get the to interpret the previous statement. So this must have been the first call. This call to interpret resolved um, and closed the browser the first time, right? Because it panicked. And then when we returned And then when we return from here, we have an OK false. Presumably the reason we exit is because um, this statement right here. So this executes, and at the end of it, it closed the driver, um, and it executed statements without failing, but why would it do that when the statements would fail? Presumably this is what led us here, so that propagated an OK true, so that caused it to that caused it to fail, and then we return again. Interesting. Let's see what the so the test worked, right? So if we look at right this test, um, we have <coughs> test script exits on double try again. Let's see what happens when the test doesn't fail. Let's have a test called, I guess we should probably do these in um, We'll organize into modules here in a minute, but let's do an async function test. Probably don't need to start our test methods with tests. Um, browser closes after Successful script run. Right, so the idea is that we want to have a successful script run, um, and then we should see the browser close at the end. So that's what we're going to have. We're going to have a script that, by all accounts, should succeed. Let's forget about um, catch error and whatnot for a minute.
Is it um let's control Z. Yeah, there we go. Seeing trailing. Uh -huh. like so. No, it shouldn't be, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Cool, cool, cool. Like that. All right, and we'll do, um, just to be really clear. Great, so that should succeed. Let's do all this, right? We will run the script. We want to assert that it was okay. Um, and then we want to assert that it returned true. And then I'm not sure how we're going to test that the browser is closed yet, but for now we're going to watch that it closes. Oh, I didn't run um whoops. Gonna add Tokyo test. And uh you know what? Let's just run this one. Register the browser. Check that out. Check that out. I think that failed. So the test didn't close. But if you look, we got this error. The result was false. The result run returned and said, hey, that script failed. Which means interpreter returned that it failed. Interpret. Oh, it's supposed to be false. False means it didn't exit earlier. See, this is this is why we gotta have we gotta do some refactoring and some clear documentation. Um so this should be true then, should it not? And this should be false. Somewhere we made a switch, right? Because in the interpreter, an early return is signified by returning true. Like an execute statement. Early return is signified by returning to. Where do we make that switch? Early return true. Right, Self.execute statement. Otherwise, we return false. So. What's causing our. If I run cargo T, let's get out of this nonsense, right? So we should run two tests. Each one should register a browser. Great. I think this is the one we care about right now. The other one should basically... Yeah, so that one finished early. OK, 
Okay, so we have two things. One, the browser is not closing after a successful test run. Um, and the script that exits early this test script exits on double try again is returning false so let's go dig into that or better yet maybe what we should do is now that we have these tests in place we should start doing refactoring and see if we can discover the error along the way that could be a good idea. Sort of think it out, comment it out as we're refactoring, figure out where we made our error. Okay, let's do it. So we are in the interpreter. What is the interpreter? The interpreter is responsible. For executing Schnauzer UI statements um, against a running Selenium grid. Okay, we have WebDriver, each interpreter. its own browser window for executing scripts or an element. Um, the locate command brings an element into focus. That element is stored here. Subsequent commands are performed against this element. Yeah, we'll just say against this element. And then obviously if you call locate again, and that changes the element that you're executing commands against. Great. Um, maintain count of screenshots taken during a test run for um, generating file names for set screenshots, right? That's really the only purpose of that. Had error. Had error field tracks whether or not the script Encountered an error and is used um, to move between catch error statements. Statements since last error handling, right? Um, we store the statements that we encounter since the last um, catch error statement in order for the try again 
command be able to re-execute them. All right, makes sense. And then we have this tried again Boolean, which is tried again Boolean is used. Uh, we'll say tried again Boolean stores whether or not we are in tried again, try again mode. Right, so when we when we start to um, try, um, when we start to execute the statement since the last error handling, we set this flag to let us know that we're in that mode. Um, and then basically, um, it is used to cause an early return in the case that we encounter an error while in try again mode. Right, so if we're trying a series of steps again and we still encounter an error, we don't just want to we don't just want to do regular error handling, we want to quit altogether. We want to say, hey, this command failed twice. There's probably something actually wrong here. It wasn't just like a wait time situation. Okay, great. So maybe it's something about the way we're using that. We'll get to it. Let's talk about our constructor. Um, constructor for the interpreter. It registers a web driver against standalone selenium grid running at port 4444, right? And the idea is that eventually we'll have a CLI where you can configure all this stuff. Um, either that or we'll have some sort of like config file or maybe we'll set global variables, who knows. Um, okay, I think that's all fairly straightforward. All right, we start with the, we register the driver. Um, there's no current element in focus. Screenshot counter starts at one. Um, had error, we haven't had one yet. Statement since last error handling is an empty vec. And tried again, where is false because we're not in tried again mode. Okay, set current element. Um, this takes a web element. Attempts to scroll the element into view and then sets the element as currently in focus. Focus. Subsequent commands will be executed against this element, right? That's fine. Get rid of that. Okay. Get current. You know what? Let's do a cargo format. Yeah. Um, get current element. So the idea here is um, we don't want to constantly be typing the code to like um, if we're trying to execute a command against the current element, um, then we really want to do a, we have a couple checks to make. If there is no current element in focus, then that's basically a runtime error, um, and so we want to we want to produce an error based on that. Um, so if if one of our commands tries to access the current element, but the current element is set to none, that's a runtime error, and so we want to we want to propagate that. Um, if there 
is a current element in focus, then basically we want a uh, we just want to clone that element and give it to the method for um, executing against. Um, it's gonna it's gonna end up um, executing against the same. Like cloning it is not gonna cause us any problems. Um, yeah. Cool. I mean, we could theoretically return like we could do an and web element like that, and then it would be right. Uh, mismatch types and thirty found thirty four web element. All right, so we need to like borrow borrow that expected right so the it's out here it's in here can we there's some sort of method on option to bring that in I know there is what is it as DREF as as ref. So I think that's it. Yeah, look at that. So um, as ref Okay, so as ref will cast that. So now we have an and and um, but there is a way to like Okay, so the idea here is that when self.current element is an option web element, so we want to borrow that. No, you know what we want to do? We want to do this. We just want to do dot as ref, right? Just, we just want to borrow the web element, and then we'll map the string. Awesome. All right, what's up with the interpreter? What's your deal? Compatible types. Convert from and 34 web element to 34 web element. What? So move to element center takes a reference to web element. OK, great. Now we're not cloning that web element anymore. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. Um, I don't think we need to rerun tests on that. It should work fine. OK, so yeah. Um, so this returns a reference to the current elements for performing operations on. Or an error if there is no current element. I've been using the word focus, but focus is actually um, focus is actually a word we use while doing web testing. Like an element being in focus is like a JavaScript kind of thing. Um, so I probably shouldn't use that. But what I mean by in focus is like this is this is the element we're concerned with right now. This is the last one we called locate on has nothing to do with like uh, yeah no element currently selected as well um, yeah we'll say selected I mean that also makes it sound like it's a select oh no element currently located we'll go with that uh, right so you have to be careful with that overlapping terminology Okay, then we have the interpret statement. Um, let's interpret's fairly important. Let's move it up here. And let's say Interprets a list of statements. 
really, we should say, executes a list of statements. Returns a Boolean indication of whether or not um, there was an early return. Right, so the idea is if we return true, then what that means is the script executed, um, the script errored early. So you know what I think we should do? I think we should have a concept of an interpret, of like a runtime error. I mean, eventually we will because we'll, we'll sort of have to like enumerate the kinds of errors we can run into. But what I mean right now is maybe we can have something like pub type runtime um, result t is going to be a result result t string and then this will say string something like this the idea is that a uh, this internal this internal result would be the um, whether or not some sort of command failed to execute right something that um, something that the error handling syntax of the script would be willing to handle um, and then this outer result would be um, would handle this concept of an early return like hey if, if we have an outer failure then we need to we need to get out of here and that way we can sort of question mark and then error handle on the inner error it's confusing let's do um, early return result the idea being that this would be some early return error right um, and then we could extract this to something called um, coverable error um, and then we would have something like pub type recoverable results t equals that right um, and then this would be like our list of recoverable errors. Thing is, um, these are actually the same, right? This concept of a um, oh, this is a recoverable result, right? What's your problem? Oh, because this fails, so. We'll just call this, but you, you get the gist, right? We'll call this string, and we'll call this string, and then we should be good. Missing generics for, t oh. All right, but what's really going on here is that these errors are the same. Um, it's just that... 
it, it's just the idea that um, if we run into it twice, we exit. But if, when we run into it the first time, we don't exit. But when we run into it twice, we do. So let's let's not do the boolean sort of thing. All right, we don't want. I think this idea of um, returning a boolean to propagate an early return is kind of lame. So maybe we could do, but I also am not in love with this, right? Maybe what we need is an enumeration. Maybe we need like pub enum um, severity, and then we have. Um, exit and recoverable and then we can have we can have a runtime result be a sort of get the T E, and you would have an error and its severity, like that. I'm not opposed to that. I'm not opposed to that. Yeah, we'll go with that. Um, brief pause. Be right back. Okay, I'm back. So where were we? Um, we had this. Uh, we we were considering this sort of signature for a um, for an error. So we have this idea of a runtime result, um, and rather than simply returning an OK value or an error, you return you return the OK value, and your error um, gets packaged up with a severity. Um, right now, the only, you know, it may be a little complex for right now, because right now, the only reason we exit is because we've, um, we've hit um, try again twice. Um, but what I think we can do with this is we can sort of extract error creation into a method and we can base it off of the field. So we have this field tried again, right? So I think what we can do is we can add a method of function add a method error which takes an and self and the message which for right now our errors are strings, so we'll call it a string. Um, and this can return a, I guess we can call it a runtime result. Um, and then that would be the type string, right? Um, the never type is experimental. Right, so we'll 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 do this for now. The idea is that this is never going to produce a. Um, this is never going to produce an OK value. Um, and instead, what we're going to do is we're going to say, if 
self dot try again tried again right so if we've already tried again and we're erroring now then we want to say um, we want to return an error with um, the given message and really we'll have this take since we're going to be sort of constructing these manually we're going to have an and string and we'll say to owned and then for the severity we want to have um, the sort of exit severity right because the idea is we're encountering this while we're in tried again mode um, else we want to do basically the same thing but this time the error is recoverable right so we can say produces um, produces an error with the appropriate severity based on whether we are currently trying um, to execute statements again yeah okay and then when we when we error we'll use this method to cause the error so here instead of um, mapping error um, like this we'll say Um, let's actually return instead of returning this runtime result let's return a tuple with the string and the severity Ooh. right and we can get rid of this error wrapping And then we can do, um, when we run into a web driver error, we can map the error to a self dot, self dot error and we give it that message. And then could not convert string. Oh right, and then this is, this now returns a runtime results. Um, like that. Type annotations needed. Oh, and the error type is string. Yeah, does that make sense? Um, so the idea is that um, when we return an error, we'll just sort of check whether we're currently in try it again mode, and that will tell us whether to um, whether where we need to exit or whether or not um, we're recoverable. And so we'll sort of go down converting these um, converting these types. Really, we can follow the compiler for a while um, converting these types. And then eventually, that should lead us to handling it um, wherever it is that we handle the error. So let's see. Down here, it's going to get mad at us. Right. This. Um, wants us to return a result tuple string. So instead, we're going to return, we're going to upgrade this to a runtime result tuple string. Could not convert, right. Okay, so what's going on here? So in resolve, let's execute command. Let's fix resolve. Oh, this is uh, the same statement. Down here, we want to self.error with this message, right? Um, we want to do an error 
then we'll say self.error like that. Yay. Then what's your problem? Couldn't convert to question mark. So we have this resolve method and you need to return a runtime result string string. Right? Um, and then that means this needs to return a runtime result. And then here, we'll map the error with self dot error, right? Um, and then here, you need to return a runtime result, and we will map the error with self dot error. Right, and then here, let's make you a runtime result. Okay, now click. Um, you need to return a runtime result. And then basically what we can do is we can self.error like so. Um, and let's go ahead and get this returning a runtime result. And we're going to say self.error. Excellent. And what's your problem? Uh, it doesn't implement display. We'll deal with that in a second. Okay, self.refresh and try again. Fresh, you can implement a runtime result. Self.error. And we may use this self.error method to add more context, you know. Um, maybe we, we want to print out like what line it occurred on and stuff like that. Um, Self dot try again. Oh, hello. Okay, so let's talk about try again. Try again now says, right, we're basically going to get rid of this. Um, we don't, when we execute the try again command. We don't really need to. We don't really need to do this like boolean return anymore. Is the idea. So on a try again, we want to set self dot try again. Um, we want to copy the statement since the last error handling um, and then clear them. We want to interpret those statements and then we want to um, and then we want to reset try it again to false because presumably we got through interpreting those statements without encountering um, or I guess the, the recursive call to Interpret is the way we did it before. We may have to we may have to do some something different here. 
and then we return OK false. Let's just try to keep this as simple as possible. Let's do on try again set self dot try again equal true maybe instead of doing this recursive call to interpret we could just push the statement since the last erroring error on the front of the statements we're executing. So we could store the statements we're executing rather than pass them to the interpret method. And then we could push those statements back on the front. And then presumably at the you only use try again in a catch error block. So at the next catch error block, we would set try it again to false. I think that might make more sense. I think this recursive stuff is where we're getting in trouble. So let's do, let's try that. You return a runtime result. String, right? Self dot try it again is true. Um, get the statement since the last error handling, clear those statements, and let's refactor interpret um, let's refactor this to take statements and let's have um, statements, which is a vec of statement. The idea being um, statements for the interpreter to execute. Here we're calling into iter. See this idea of that see this is converting it to a different type. So this would have to say something like um, while let some statement equal self dot statements dot is there a pop yeah right and that's going to give us the statement um, but it's always going to go back to this self dot statements so that that way need statements right And then in try again, what we do is rather than having a recursive call like all this, we say self dot statements dot is there a push front? I guess we're popping, so we really just want to push. Um, Actually, I can do this. And then we'll do this. 
right? So we'll push um, the previously run statements back onto the interpreter. And then we'll clear previously run statements. And then we'll return This doesn't really need to return anything, does it? None of this fails. Expected statement. Oh, um, what, probably append? Yeah. can have a reference to it. Go for it. Expect you can have a mutable reference. Go go for it. Just drain it. Just will it drain it? I don't know. I'm gonna call clear anyway. Um, okay. So the idea is that try again doesn't it doesn't fail. All it does is sort of rearrange the state of the interpreter. So here, it's also not async. So the idea here is that we would have, we would call try again, and then this command always succeeds. So let's return an OK true, and we'll sort of get rid of this Boolean soon. Um, what's your problem? Screenshot. Turn a runtime result, my friend. So now we have these, the runtime results, and we're sort of, um, now we don't really need this Boolean, right? So we can. Instead of all this, right, can we Turn what's in this because at the end I'm just going to say okay, nice work team, right? But instead of all this nonsense, just do that, and then down here. We can just call try again, right? Um, cargo format should inline that for us. Okay. Now, execute command, rather than returning a Boolean, um, to say whether or not to do the early return, that should be part of the runtime result, right? We have the severity returned along with it. So when we handle execute command, we match self.execute command. It's not going to be if it's if it's okay, then we should execute the right hand side. The severity 
is in the air. So this returns a boolean. Um, for whether or not to exit. So now we have like sort of two places where error handling is going on. Um, we're matching on execute command in order to print the error here. Um, and then in execute statement, if we had an error, then we match on this. If we, if we have not had an error, then we match on the statement and we, we go and execute it, right? Um, and if we reach a catch error block, but we um, have not had some kind of error, then we don't really execute what's behind that. All we really do is we, um, we clear the statement since the last error handling, and then we just um, return false to say, don't, don't short circuit. Um, let's do a, we just propagate. Propagate to interpret. Right, interpret says if self.execute statement. Um, so if this returns true, then we sort of do this closing of the driver. Let's have, hmm, interpret is basically the main function for the interpreter, right? Um, so we probably don't want it to return um, in reality we wouldn't want it returning anything except that we kind of want to test it um, we, we do kind of want it indicating some whether or not the script failed early because it's going to help us with writing our test cases so we may keep it like that um, thinking maybe we could um, we could store how many statements we've executed and that way we could say you know you you should error on statement we could test that it errors on a particular line that's that's not a bad idea uh, maybe we'll add that later but okay so I'm okay with this boolean indication for now but the way it's gonna work is execute statement is going to return a runtime results string like that um, as is execute command statement So let's just do so the idea here really is just we want to execute the left hand side um, and if that errors then go ahead and return. But if it doesn't error, then we execute the right-hand side. So I think this can literally say something to the effect of self dot execute command 
um, command statement dot left hand side, and then if that errors, we'll early return with the reason why. And then we'll say, if we get past that, then we can say if let's um, don't care about the and token. And if we don't end up using this and token, um, we might just not even store it. Um, right hand side equals cs dot right hand side. Then we'll execute on the right hand side and just return whatever the result is of that. Right? Yeah? It's a tuple. There we go. Um, oh, and then otherwise, if there's no right hand side statement to execute, then we can just say good job, everybody. Okay, now we've successfully pushed the errors up here. I like it. I like it. Um, okay. If we have not had an error, a command statement, we should maybe we should move handling if we had an error up. Mm, no. Okay, so execute command statement is now going to return a runtime result. And basically, if it fails, then um, we can investigate the error. Um, we can investigate that error tuple to see if we should um, quit or not. But we have an execute statement. Um, what we do with this statement depends on whether or not we've just had an error, right? The idea is that if we've not had an error, we'll do it normally. But if we've had an error, um, then for most statements, we just want to um, keep track of it and then um, return OK, right? The idea being uh, we're not going to cause an error, just sort of like reading the rest. This is after we've had an error. We're not going to cause an error um, just by reading over the rest. We, we don't want to execute them. We just want to sort of store them. And then if we run into a catch error statement, then what we want to do is we want to set self dot hat error back to false, right? Because we're done we're done with the hat error stage, which is we're just reading in commands. And then we execute the command statement. Um, So I think we may need to do this in a different order, and this may be what's bugging us. So I think what we need to do is we need to execute execute the command statement, and if that errors, we need to go ahead and bubble up the error, including the fact that we erred in the had error state. Then, then if that didn't error, 
then we can set self hat error equals false. So this is not the um, right. So this execute command statement um, that's the sort of reset stuff, right? So we're trying once we've caught an error, we we have the opportunity to do some reset. Now that might be the try again command. It might not. Um, I think though, so if, if there is a, a try again command, it will be included in the execute command statement. Um, yes, yeah, so the idea before was that all of those would execute, but now the way try again works is it basically just readjusts the interpreter. So I'm thinking if we had an error, when we get to the catch error statement, we want to execute command statement. We want to execute um, the sort of uh, the statement that follows catch error, and that might include try again. And try again will readjust the interpreter. So we're still in the had error statement after the try again command succeeds. So we don't quite want to reset had error yet because we need to know if we're still in the in the try again portion. So we'll return OK. And we'll have to we'll have to set that somewhere else. During try again. We could have an internal statement. Um, we could have an internal statement that only we construct called um, flip try again. And so when we push statements to the interpreter, we could also push a flip try again statement so that we have like a barrier to tell us when we when we got where we wanted to do. I actually think that's what I want to do. Okay, so yeah, so let's fix this really quickly. Um, yeah, if we run into a comment, we want to info log it um, and then return okay rather than false. And then if we run into a catch error, but we've not had an error, we basically want to um, ignore it. So we're just going to clear the statement since last error handling line. Then we're going to return OK. And then let's have OK, great. So this is good. Um, and then execute statement can say if self dot execute error dot awaits. Right, so let's just match on this rather than doing this if statement. We'll say let's match this. And we should get okay whatever um, and if we get okay whatever it literally do nothing just keep swimming right um, if we get some error which is an error and a severity, right? That's our error, and that's our severity. We can match the severity Okay. 
self.execute statement. Okay, here's the key. Right, so down here, we do this a whole rigmarole, right? With the match if self dot had error else. Um, because we want to tell it how to handle this catch error statement. Maybe what we want to do is extract that to a method and then based on whether or not we've had an error to it, based on whether or not we're in try again mode, I don't know. Um, it's tough, it's tough, right? So interpret, when should this return early? So if, if we have an, an exit severity error, the idea is we want to return true. If an error makes it to severity recoverable, then literally all we want to do is we want to set self dot had error to true, right? Can we do that anywhere else? I know we closed the driver here. We're going to deal with that in a minute. Um, and then rather than, oh yeah, and then you return false. Great. Really, we can just say false, right? Um, return, but not early. We can say we completed the entire script, right? Where do we set self dot had error to true? It's mentioned two times. Here we set it to true here, and then we use it there. Great. That's what we want, right? Yeah. And then in lib, oh, um, you expect statements there. Great. And then now in the interpreter, oh, if we encounter a recoverable error, probably want to log that error. So we're going to error, this is what we deleted earlier. Uh, e, yep, we're gonna log that error. Um, and then what we wanna do is we want to add a statement um, to flip try again, right? So in parser, really we'll do this in the interpreter. Well, we have to do it in the parser, don't we? So we have this concept, we have this statement, um, but we'll add, oh, that's the display. Um, we'll add this set try again field. We'll say this statement is not meant to be parsed. It is added by the interpreter um, this is added by the interpreter as part of try again pretty buggy the idea of right we really want to uh, not buggy pretty hacky we really want our statements to represent statements but we'll we'll try this for now Um, and we don't really want to write anything here. 
um, because this is a manually added thing. So let's just do a empty string, shall we? And in the interpreter, it's saying, what do I do? Um, what do I do when I encounter this statement? Well, if you encounter the statement when you've not had an error, um, you really shouldn't. Right. So the idea is that um, in try again, um, we add this statement self dot statements dot push. Um, statement set try again field, right? So that when we're when we start redoing the statements, um, we should be in had error mode. Well no, we shouldn't. Um, we'll set that to set that to false. But when we start reinterpreting statements, um, we can run into this and it will tell us that um, we need to reset um, the try again field to false because we're done trying again things, right? So we could say rename symbol, set try again field to false. The idea being that we'll pop off the statement since the last um, error handling and then um, we will and then we'll um, run into this and say okay we're done trying again. So when we run into this when we run into this are we in the had error state where do we set the had error state the had error state gets set here if we run into a recoverable error then we just set had error equal to true and keep going when do we set it to false control f self dot had error We check it. We need to set it to false in the catch error, right? So when we right once we enter self dot had error state, that's when we start skipping statements. Um, and what we need to do in the catch error, we need to execute the command statement. Uh, and the try again should just um, should just add statements back. So then we need to self dot add error equals false, right? And then if we run into a set try again field to false, then we say self dot uh, try again self dot tried again equals false and then we return okay okay and then the only thing we have to do now is deal with one final thing which is that we changed this from um, iterating over we change this from like looping over the statements to popping the statements um, and the way it's written now it's going to execute 
um, the, the script backwards. It's going to start at the bottom. So we need to um, we need to say self dot, better yet, we'll do it up here. We need to say um, we'll shadow it. Let's statements equals statements dot into iter dot reverse dot collect right yeah okay so theoretically that works um, so the idea with our tests is that this one um, should we run this script and then um, the result should be okay, right? Um, again, the run function, the only way the run function returns an error is if the constructor of the interpreter failed. Um, and that shouldn't happen. So this should return okay, and then the result of that okay, sh inside that okay should be a true, indicating that there was some kind of early return. Um, whereas this one should return OK false because there was no early return. That was a lot. That was a lot. It's unlikely to work. How are we doing on time? 147. I'm not going to bother to uh, watch the tests run. The idea being that we should really move to trusting our test suite. I guess I'll have a look. What are we doing here? One one passed, great. How's this one doing? We got the sixty seconds warning. Are you gonna refresh or are you gonna I think we took out the thing that closed you, so you might not close, but... Okay, so look, so we took out the thing that closed the browser, but our test passed! Woo! Woo! Okay, great. Um, so these scripts are returning what they're supposed to about um, how the execution of the, the script worked. Woo! Okay, so now... Um, this test is poorly named because it's not testing whether the browser closed. Um, let's call this run. Let's call this um, test. Uh, we'll say good test does not error. Valid name, not an identifier. Good test does not error. Oh, why'd I call it dot rs? Good test does not error. Great. And we'll call this name symbol bad test errors. Great. And then let's have the browser close. Um, and then we'll be done with this video. And when we come back, we'll continue with our um, refactoring and commenting and organizing before adding variables.
Um, okay, when should we close the browser? Well, if we're going to exit, that's when we should close the browser. So let's take this and let's say turn true and let's do self dot driver dot I think it's closed window now. Yeah. Close is deprecated. Dot await um, dot So we could say dot is okay, right? Um, what I think I want to do instead is I want to have interpret actually return a web driver result as well with a boolean and then do this and then return Okay, true. The idea being that um, if the if the driver fails to close at the end of test execution, um, that's a different kind of error. That's like an internal error kind of thing. Um, so in ooh, oh, you need to say okay, false. Great. Good. Now in lib, right? We return okay result but result is now a web driver result itself that's what um, web driver result t sugars to there's a very if, um, if if the part we did about error um, the sort of type signatures for our errors was confusing earlier there's a very common pattern in rust where um, uh, when you do error handling you use this thing called a result it's basically um, it's just an enum um, and you can either have a value for when everything went right um, or you can have a value for when there's an error right and the idea is that you can sort of propagate that information and then with each function call you can check did this go right and then do something with the result of that or you can say did this error and then do something with the context of that error um, so there's a very common pattern in Rust where you have you have your custom error defined in some way, like we, we could have a key, an enum custom custom error, right? And then it would have all sorts of fields on it. And then rather than constantly write like results, whatever we want to uh, return, say we're returning nothing, and then custom error, instead we do this type alias where we say pub type um, custom um, result t equals result t customary so that whenever we have a function signature instead of just saying instead of having to say something like um, result boolean web driver error we can say web driver result bool or in our case we can just say custom result bool right Just wanted to point that out. Um, but yeah, so this is a web driver result. That's what this result bool web driver area is. So we can just return it. In fact, we don't even have to save it to a variable anymore. We can just do that. Great. Um, yeah. Yeah, and then if, if the driver failed to close, right? So now we can write a function like this, right? We can write a function like driver closes after execution. And we can have a script. We can have this same script, right? Um, and we're actually just going to navigate to the URL. That's the only step we're going to have. But what we want to do is um, this part. We just want to assert, assert the result is okay. Because the, 
the only way the result would be in error, the only way that um, the interpreter function, the interpret function would return an error is if we failed to close the browser, right? This WebDriver result is exclusively for, right, the, the error part of this WebDriver result is exclusively for here, if we fail to close the browser window. So now we can write this test, great. We'll give it the Tokyo test attribute. Right, and the last one was still open. So let me quit this actually. Um, the last browser from the test run was still open, so I'll exit out of that as well. tests to execute. I know they've been running for over 60 seconds. We'll deal with that in the next video too. five browsers open. So the closes after execution test passed. That clicked something. What is happening here? Okay, so we have five windows open. Our three tests passed. But we have five windows open. What is that about? Go away. Um, let's restart Selenium. Sometimes if you're, um, I use Selenium for a ton of other stuff, um, and sometimes when you're running Selenium in headless mode, um, it'll like crash and then the browser will all of a sudden show up. Um, I wonder if that's what's going on here. So we have these three tests. And I think by default, they run in, um, I think Tokyo Test should run them in a different thread. Don't know. Well, let's see if we launch five browsers again. Let's see if that's something that Let's see if that's a repeated error.
Okay, here we go. Three browsers. That's how many we want. Two of them passed already. Okay, so our three tests passed, but only one of the browsers closed. Um, the one we expected to close closed, I think. Like this one is the one that types test at test.com. Let's, um, let's investigate. Let's send this browser just to this page, right? just to the localhost page. Um, and that way we'll be able to tell which browser actually closed. We have three browsers. The one on top is the one that just navigated to the uh, to the test URL. So the test driver closes after execution, and good test does not error. Is saying it passes. Yeah, so it's only it's only this one that is in fact closing. It's only the um, it's only the error test that's closing, and that's because we only call driver.close when we exit, and we need to call driver.close. Ooh, okay. And we need to call driver.close before exiting on a valid test run. And now this will actually give us an indication of whether or not the driver successfully closed. And we won't accidentally call it twice because we're not calling interpret recursively anymore. Let's do it. Prove me right. Why do we only have one browser launched? We should have two browsers still launched. Good test does not error. This one. We lost the browser. We lost the browser. How did we lose the browser?
it's still running but doesn't have the browser for it may have to manually quit this. Um, I'm hoping that it's like trying to do some sort of query um, and it's going to error because the um, session with the browser closed. Oh wait, oh there it is. Oh it just took forever to launch. Okay, okay so we're good so far. More on that later. See you next time.